The next paper is entitled Science in Default, 22 Years of Inadequate UFO Investigations by Dr. James E. McDonald, Senior Physicist, Institute for Atmospheric Physics and Professor of Meteorology, University of Arizona. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The uh, AAAS, I think, is to be congratulated for organizing and holding this symposium. I fully agree with the remarks that Dr. Sagan made that uh, there is a scientific obligation to examine questions such as uh, that of the unidentified flying objects, an obligation of the public uh, to science itself. And uh, as the title of my uh, remarks indicates, my study of the problem leads me to take the position that uh, we in science are in default, have been in default for two decades, for failing to close with a problem uh, that uh, created such widespread concern, both here and abroad, uh, failing to close with it uh, long ago. Uh, I want to uh, get across to you the viewpoint that, again, based on my examination of the problem, that it is primarily the failure uh, of scientists to look at this problem closely uh, and not primarily, not primarily, the Air Force mishandling the problem that uh, has left it in a limbo that it still lies in 1969. When I suggest that I uh, regard all 22 years as um, adding up to inadequate UFO investigations, I'm including, quite intentionally, uh, essentially all that has uh, transpired, including the most recently conducted economy report. If you go back, as I have done in the last three years of uh, checking the problem, and look carefully at uh, Project Sign and its contents and conclusions, if you look carefully at uh, what you can get a hold of in Project Drudge and its conclusions, if you look, as I have, at uh, Wright-Patterson files and then go over very carefully the original monthly Project Blue Book reports and then Project uh, Blue Book Report 14 and uh, examine the record as the years have gone by, look at it in terms of just ordinary, run-of-the-mill scientific standards of investigation, if you look at it carefully, I think you would have to agree uh, that it is inadequate and it has been very superficial suggestions that the Air Force has put any appreciable talent onto the Air Force problem over the years does not match at all what one finds at Blue Book. There has not been application of the best scientific facilities available to the United States Air Force as press releases have over, have over and over again suggested. That is not the case. Uh, even uh, as obvious an organization as Air Force Cambridge Research Labs with its substantial talent, uh, only in one very brief period in 1952 were brought into the picture, and again and again, Air Force radar cases have failed to be uh, put before the kind of people uh, in Air Force organizations that really have the expertise to look at them. So contrary to what we in the scientific community were told as the years went by, when you look at the nature of the investigations in individual reports, uh, you, you, you are quite surprised. And my, my position there is quite quick. It is superficial and it is not competent investigation that has gone into Project Blue Book. Um, if uh, a lot of time permitted, I, I would discuss a lot of particular illustrations of that point. Uh, time doesn't permit it. I simply put myself clearly on record as describing uh, the problem in those terms. Uh, the, a fairly large share of Air Force explanations have pretty much fallen in my area of interest, atmospheric physics, another broad uh, cut of them goes uh, into uh, astronomy in a fairly elementary way. And it was the atmospheric physics problem that got me interested in the UFO problem some time ago, uh, and uh, particularly in uh, 1966. I took uh, upon myself to get up to Wright-Patterson, and my interest in the UFO problem went through a step function change, excuse me, a step function change after three days of poring over uh, the Wright-Patterson files. Uh, they are astonishing, in my opinion. Uh, cases that I had never believed that I had heard about uh, are really there, uh, and uh, cases, the documents of which are uh, quite extensive, and I want to turn to some of them uh, fairly shortly. Uh, my my um, encounter with the Wright-Patterson files was one of extremely great surprise that so much evidence could be just shoved under the rug for so many years and not be uh, put under uh, real life of scientific scrutiny. 
Well, the years have gone by, the uh, reports have continued to come in, the public has continued to be puzzled, and uh, due to a sequence of events that occurred in 65 and 66, a new look was finally suggested, primarily by the O'Brien Committee, uh, and this eventuated as the Cunning Report, and that is the last and undoubtedly the most presently relevant part of the 22 years of investigation. And to say that again, uh, my study of the Cunning Report, and I've been putting a great deal of my time on it for the past nine months, uh, checking uh, many cases that uh, weren't previously uh, familiar to me and going over the common evaluations of those already familiar to me, uh, I, I would have to say there uh, that, um, once again, it is not a thoroughgoing and adequate investigation of the UFO problem. The conclusions that Dr. Condon uh, reached in his summary analysis that the problem doesn't worth, uh, merit further scientific uh, study uh, I think is not at all supported by the contents of the report, as the previous speaker, I believe, also uh, suggested. As a matter of fact, uh, of the sample of cases, and I now want to uh, talk about the Conner Report briefly, of the roughly 90 cases that are looked at, um, uh, approximately a third, it's a little difficult to decide in many instances what the final uh, conclusion is in the uh, in specific cases, my tally is that about 32 out of the 89 or 90 cases are in the unexplained category. And I think that point has to be stressed very emphatically, and I think it's very significant that a major effort uh, uh, mounted uh, by the Air Force and uh, uh, funded uh, with substantial uh, uh, amount of money uh, ended up with approximately a third of all the cases that it uh, considered uh, not explained in any satisfactory degree. Furthermore, a substantial number of the 90 cases are just not interesting cases. Cases that I think experienced investigators would have looked at twice uh, are given fairly large amounts of attention, quite a few crackpot cases. If there's anything that can be separated out easily in the UFO problem, it's the crackpot cases, yet some of them even made their way into the final report. Uh, another uh, major objection that I would cite to the common report is that in contrast to what I think many of us expected, a careful confrontation with some of the most puzzling historic cases that date back to 47, 48, 49, for example, the Condon Report has very few of the historically most puzzling cases, and some of these are left unexplained. Some of the small number of those that do appear in the sample are left unexplained. Others are, quote, explained away uh, in, uh, with scientific argumentation that I take the strongest issue with, and again, I will cite some examples. There are cases that were investigated that don't appear uh, at all in the report. Uh, Level in Texas is an, ex an example, one that I think a number of us here are familiar with that was investigated that doesn't appear at all, occurred at Redlands, California in early 1968, in February 4th. I interviewed about uh, eight witnesses. Uh, professors at the University of Redlands interviewed about 25. This was a case of a, uh, a large number of people uh, hearing unusual sounds getting out in the street, uh, looking up and uh, from a variety of directions that, uh, crudely speaking, triangulated moderately well, uh, uh, indicated an object at about 1,000 feet elevation. Ultimately, early it was about 300 feet. Uh, estimated to be about 50 or 60 feet in diameter uh, when most of the people were uh, out looking at it uh, and all that I interviewed uh, were watching it. It was making no sound, hovering motionless. Uh, it was a disc-shaped object with a uh, luminous uh, um, uh, surface around the side of it. Uh, it uh, suddenly shot up uh, to two or three times its original height, estimated 300 up to about 1,000, moved off a distance of several blocks seen by still other people, uh, this case, uh, and finally uh, uh, moved off, this case was explained to the Air Force as a small aircraft. Uh, there were no aircraft in the area at the time, as the University of Redlands people ascertained. I cite this as an example, an example, of a case investigated by the Conner Report, which didn't even get into uh, the report at all. Uh, but the primary objection that I would make to the Conner evaluations are scientific, and scientific uh, argumentation, uh, involved, I think, uh, it leaves a very great deal to be desired in terms of discussion of radar cases, meteorological optical phenomena, uh, aeronautical effects, and so on. Uh, but let me turn next to some specific examples of cases in the Condon Report that come from Air Force files. I'm trying to hit a number of 
kill a number of birds, or at least throw stones at a number of uh, birds here, with a minimum number of stones and maximum birds. So I'm going to now discuss four specific cases that, to me, illustrate reasons why one must scientifically say there exists a problem here, that there are unexplained phenomena of serious scientific interest, that illustrate shortcomings of the past level of Air Force investigations of the uh, problem, that illustrate shortcomings of the common project investigation or of the final conclusions, uh, and uh, that finally are just plain uh, uh, crying for scientific attention. Um, the first case that I want to talk about occurred in uh, 1957, uh, September 19th uh, and 20th of 1957, involves an Air Force RB-47. This is one, all four of these cases I'm talking about are Condon Report cases. All four are Air Force related. Um, this case was reported rather casually to the staff of the Condon Project. Uh, uh, when uh, a group of Air Force UFO officers were called in for a briefing session, and one of them, a then major, now Colonel Chase from then Malmstrom, but now retired, uh, was um, uh, mentioned briefly the incident. Uh, they uh, got tape recordings from him. Uh, these were uh, uh, discussed within the project, uh, uh, and uh, the um, case was particularly discussed uh, for Dr. Condon's benefit. But in the Condon report, this very intriguing case. Uh, it rather uh, briefly and very incompletely passed off, and Dr. Condon himself, in his discussion, does not even mention this particular uh, RB-47 case. The RB-47 uh, was coming out of Forbes Air Force Base, a night exercise down over the Gulf, uh, gunnery and navigation exercises, and then coming in north for ECM exercises against ground radar, uh, simulating uh, enemy penetrations. Uh, and using ECM gear aboard this RB-47 because it was an uh, ECM-equipped plane. It didn't have three, but rather six Air Force officers. The Condon uh, investigators uh, stopped when they had contacted three. I eventually located all six, and it was well worth the search to get further information on this case. They were flying a little after midnight, uh, early morning hours, at uh, around 35,000 feet, at cruising speed of the order of 500 knots. And the incident begins, and you have no information about this in the Condon Report, uh, the incident begins over Gulfport, Mississippi, when Major McClure, on the number two ECM uh, radar monitor, received a signal from a peculiar location. Uh, it uh, was coming in from an apparent position out of the Gulf as they were northbound over Gulfport, Mississippi, and a blip on his uh, display scope for the ECM monitor indicated some kind of a, uh, a radar signal coming in from out on the Gulf. That could have been a uh, picket ship of some kind, but as McClure watched, the blip on the scope moved up scope, uh, indicating uh, that it couldn't be out uh, as a stationary object uh, out in the Gulf. Uh, he thought for a, a first hypothesis that this was a ground-based uh, radar, perhaps somewhere up in uh, Louisiana or Arkansas, and that it was displaying with 180 degree ambiguity on his ALA-6 uh, display scope, and that uh, whereas it seemed to be going up this way, it was really out there, and their motion was making it move uh, down scope, and 180 degree ambiguity was reversing the signal. Uh, he uh, didn't say anything about this to the other man, and didn't even say anything about uh, the signal when a still more startling feature occurred. Uh, when it got up to the 12 o'clock position dead ahead, instead of stopping, it went down the other side. Uh, and that took out of consideration the possibility that this was any stationary ground signal from a CPS uh, 6B or something like that uh, out uh, in, 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 the, in the area ahead, because it had now essentially orbited the B-36. I asked McClure very carefully, and, you, and apparently the Condon investigators did not, what were the detailed uh, characteristics of this signal? And he still, he's now stationed off at Air Force Base where I located him. He was quite emphatic in saying that this, in all respects, had pulse characteristics, signal characteristics of a, a fairly standard type of uh, uh, typical uh, ground surveillance radar. It was at 2800 megacycles, that, that's why he got it on his monitor. And it was a pulse signal. Uh, the pulse characteristics, repetition, frequency, and so on were uh, entirely similar to ground uh, radar. And he said the strangest thing of all was that it even simulated a scan rate. 
So a little surprise that when he first found it, he thought it must be a ground radar. I want to emphasize that we're not, I'm not talking here about somebody in an airplane looking at something with radar. It needs to be emphasized that we're talking here about a passive direction-finding radar monitor that does no more than uh, receive the signal from an enemy radar, get its pulse characteristics to a pulse analyzer, and above all, get its directions, uh, uh, get directional bearings on it. And that's the, that's the type of device I'm talking about here. Well, uh, he slur still said nothing to the crew about this until the next incident occurred. And this is mentioned in the common report, uh, though you have no notion. Again, I'm, I'm, I'm getting across to you the point that when you read the common report, you very frequently can cite many examples, very frequently are getting a most truncated account of the report. You have the impression in reading this account that it all occurred in the general vicinity of Fort Worth and a little bit over in Louisiana. But these events that I've just cited began in Gulfport, Mississippi, and this unidentified phenomenon was with them for 600 miles and one hour instead of being a very localized and brief encounter such as one I think would read from the Conan Report. They turned westbound over Jackson, Mississippi, and the pilot, uh, uh, Colonel Chase, suddenly uh, got on the intercom announcing to the crew they should be prepared for uh, a sudden evasive maneuver because he thought a jet was closing fast, landing lights uh, on, a bright light, bright white light coming in a little bit above their level, uh, and just before he could uh, put uh, his uh, craft into a, uh, an evasive turn, the object very suddenly, and Chase's uh, description was a little saltier than that, uh, but briefly it came to the conclusion that in his 20 years of flying with the Air Force, he had never seen anything move as rapidly as this bright, luminous source shifted from his 11 o'clock position uh, almost instantaneously, as you could see it move across, but shifted to their 2 o'clock position uh, and blinked out. So here was a light that came in, a little above 35,000 foot B-47 altitude, uh, intensely bright, was taken to be jet landing lights, but suddenly moved through about 45 or 60 degrees of arc and then blinked up. Uh, they got on the, uh, Chase was on the intercom and said uh, something about this light and uh, made some brief comment uh, about maybe it was a flying saucer. And that, for the first time, led McClure to wonder about whether the incident that I just mentioned a moment ago back over Gulfport might be something a little out of the ordinary beyond the electronic range. And so McClure turned, uh, uh, retuned his, uh, his uh, uh, ECM monitor to the same frequency on which he had been receiving these radar-like signals from the peculiar orbiting, seemingly orbiting source, and found again that uh, he was getting the signal at this position where it had blinked out. Uh, it was no longer a, a luminous source uh, at that position. The, uh, the uh, ECM monitor, however, did get a strong signal, the same characteristics, 2800 megacycles, from that position, and he then uh, reported uh, this to the cockpit crew and, and pointed out what had happened back uh, over Gulfport. Uh, they proceeded to try to uh, the, all the usual maneuvers to change speed and so on, but they couldn't shake the source that stayed with them now at the same 2 o'clock position, there, uh, again indicating it was not any ground-based uh, device because they're moving ahead at 500 knots, had it been a new, it could have been another radar source on the ground, it would have again moved down scope as, their, uh, as they advanced forward. It stayed with them. So Colonel, Ch Colonel Chase in co uh, contacted Carswell GCI uh, and asked if there was any traffic there. GCI immediately announced, yes, there's an aircraft 10 miles from you at your 2 o'clock position. So at this point, the source was non luminous, was emitting radar like signals, was giving skin paint return from a radar on the ground, and from this time to the, to the end of the object was being tracked by ground radar uh, radars uh, out of GCI Carswell Air Force Base. Uh, shortly after they first got uh, word that it was being tracked on radar from GCI, Passive Monitor and GCI simultaneously reported to the cockpit crew, the ground radar by uh, radio and uh, McClure by intercom that the signal was moving forward. Compatible behavior moving forward both the B-36, the B-47, until it got dead ahead at the 12 o'clock position and then suddenly blinked back on with a bright, luminous, uh, red light this time. And Chase's description was big as a house. It had been white before, was now red, dead ahead. So at this juncture in this incident, uh, there are three different physical channels of information coming in. Uh, radar, skin paint from the ground, 
uh, ECM monitor receiving electromagnetic radiation in the radar in the, in the radar frequencies from the source dead ahead and visual optical frequencies, uh, pilot and co-pilot. I've talked, uh, as I say, to the co-pilot as well as the pilot and all four of the other men. Uh, they attempted to close, went to full power, couldn't close on it, stayed ahead of them. Uh, they were by this time moving uh, across eastern Texas and to Fort Worth. It veered northwestward over Fort Worth. They got clearance to uh, depart from the original flight path, got all of the jet aircraft out of the area, and uh, went to maximum power, attempting to close on it, when suddenly it stopped on the GCI radar. Uh, the, the radar, uh, the GCI announced it was not moving any longer. Uh, Colonel Chase uh, described it as becoming quite obvious that it was closing rapidly on it, uh, still emitting uh, 2800 megacycle signal until he nearly got over it. And by that time, he veered a little, but it was below his altitude, he stressed. So he's looking at it down at the depression angle, which he, would, he put it more than 45 degrees. And suddenly, three things happened simultaneously. It blinked out. It disappeared from the ECM monitor. It disappeared from Carswell GCI. These are puzzling phenomena. He put the 47 into a, a, a strong turn, uh, got it um, uh, by about Mineral Wells, Texas, uh, half around, and he and McCoy, looking back over the shoulder out of the blister of the 47, suddenly saw the intensely red light come on, now much below their flight altitude. Simultaneously, GCI said it's back on the scope, and McClure in the back end and Provenzano on another monitor announced it was back on the two monitors. I should interject a comment that after uh, McClure uh, uh, announced his earlier sighting, they found it on one of the other three uh, ECM monitors. So they were tracking it on two ECM monitors, and it came back on at the same time that it came back visually and came back on GCI. Uh, he, uh, Chase got permission to dive on it in the B-47, uh, and uh, shortly before he got to uh, somewhere near its altitude, specifically when he got to 20,000 feet in his account, he estimated it to be down at 15,000 feet at this juncture, rough estimate. Suddenly, it blinked out visually. It disappeared from the GCI ground radar scope and, and its uh, signal uh, terminated. He uh, put it uh, into a climb uh, back to 25,000, headed north, being low on fuel at this time, and suddenly it came back on the ECM monitor. GCI said it's 10 miles aft of you uh, in tail position. He could not at this juncture see it uh, because of the uh, position of the blister on the B-47. Uh, the unknown source followed them up into Oklahoma and finally disappeared from GCI and from the monitor. Let's go. Now, to start that, that take, took about 10 minutes to describe that single case, just one UFO incident. But this involves, as you can see, six Air Force officers. It's a case from the Conan Report files. It is one in that category of unexplained cases, not explained cases in the Conan Report. There is some toying around with various ideas, but they uh, don't even come near to fitting the phenomena, and it is conceded to be unexplained. And this I offer you as an example, just, just one example, of the puzzling phenomena that got through the filter of the Condon uh, investigation uh, without adequate explanation, and yet uh, which are essentially ignored in Dr. Condon's final conclusion that there's nothing of further interest in the whole question and we should terminate uh, further attention to the whole thing. Uh, Blue Book should be perhaps discontinued and last week was. Uh, I say phenomena like that uh, demand explanation. Uh, and uh, there are many, many more uh, such instances. The next case that I take as an example uh, is uh, the Lakeney case that Dr. Uh, Heineck re referred to very briefly, but which it takes me about six pages of uh, very fine print to uh, discuss at all adequately because it's an extremely involved incident. It occurred in August of 1956 over eastern England in Suffolk, uh, Lake and Heath and uh, Bentwaters our uh, RAF stations. Incidentally, the reader of the Conan Report is not given dates or localities or witness names, and that makes it fairly difficult for some independent investigators to check it. But uh, in uh, this case, as in a number of others, I have secured the original Blue Book file reports. Uh, I still don't have the names because it is part of Blue Book policy uh, to razor blade out names of all witnesses, and uh, that complicates things a bit, but uh, doesn't preclude recognition of when one has a significant incident. First of all, one again meets with uh, a very deficient reporting in the Conan Report. 
three quite puzzling radar incidents at Bentwaters GCA station on the east coast of England are not even mentioned in the Cotton Report, but they constitute the beginning of this five-hour-long episode in which ground visual, airborne visual, ground radar, and airborne radar sightings of unidentified uh, moving objects, sources, uh, are involved. And the initial three sightings at Bentwaters uh, on uh, GCA radars involve very high-speed uh, tracking, uh, consistent uh, tracking of echoes across the scope. Uh, the first one occurred at 9.30 in the evening. Uh, there are um, uh, internally inconsistent uh, speed estimates given. This is very characteristic of Blue Book reports. It is, it is excruciating uh, to attempt scientific analysis of uh, most of the Blue Book reports because there was never any real follow-up. Indices were never clarified by anybody going back to the original witnesses. With rare exceptions, nobody went back to the original witnesses and got the most obvious uh, shortcomings filled in. So one derives three different speeds uh, for the first radar tracking uh, plotting incident in this case, uh, but they're all above 2,000 miles an hour. The most likely so, uh, estimate of all three is the one that the radar operator gives in terms of the spacing of the blips, and that gave 12,000 miles per hour. Speeds range from four, there are four, nine, and 12,000 mile an hour estimates, all for this single sighting, all within the Blue Book report, none of them discussed further in the report, no other evidence of any uh, further uh, uh, cross-check. But the point here is that on this MPN-11A GCA radar, the object moved from about 40 miles east to about 30 mi miles west of GCA, a track right across the uh, radar, uh, and uh, that began this whole incident. Uh, then there was a second high-speed sighting later on, but in between this, uh, one of the tech sergeants at Bentwaters, this is a, these are U.S., these are Air Force, uh, American Air Force, uh, a detachment personnel at an RAF station. The second of the three sightings involved 12 objects in rough array following three uh, uh, targets, I should say, uh, follow in, in triangular formation. They moved across the scope from south to north in a 25-minute period at a speed that varied between 80 and 125 knots, quite unrelated to the wind speed, uh, about a factor of four times greater than the wind speed and uh, about 90 degrees to the direction at uh, the uh, levels that were estimated, uh, very much lower than the original uh, uh, speed, but corresponding to no known traffic, at the end of about 25 minutes, all 12 of the scattered targets merged into a single target, and then the target was motionless for 10 minutes on the scope, uh, then the single composite target, whose uh, intensity was compared to that of the D-36, moved north uh, a few more miles, stopped again for about 15 minutes, and then moved off scope. Again, here we go from, from multi, from sort of hypersonic speeds, you might say, uh, to uh, very much sub subsonic speeds of targets that are not, uh, don't correspond to any known uh, traffic. They merge, they remain motionless, and then move off the scope. This was followed by a third sighting uh, at high speed from west to east again, uh, uh, up in the multi-thousand uh, range. It was given as 2,000 to 4,000 miles an hour, moved entirely across the scope, unlike anything in the in the realm of anomalous propagation, not compatible at all with uh, interference from another station, not comparable to electronic uh, uh, trouble, uh, not moving along a radius or uh, not, not stationary, but moving entirely across the scope. Well, a fourth sighting finally led to some action. None, none of this uh, uh, led to any uh, major action. A fourth sighting at uh, about 11 o'clock that night of another high-speed target west to east finally led to Bentwater's uh, GCA alerting another American detachment at Lakenheath GCA. And it's only the subsequent parts of the report that are discussed in the Conant Report and very sketchily and in, in, in a very disturbing manner. All of the original t uh, teletype message from Lakenheath is reproduced verbatim in the Conant Report with A, A1, A2, and so on, and only the answers, no questions. So the reader who is not already thoroughly familiar with the format of Air Force Regulation 200-2 is given the answers without the questions. And consequently, most people will have a very little notion of what is really going on in this incident and uh, how, how very puzzling it is. Shortly after the GCA unit at Lake Neath was alerted, uh, the um, uh, ground uh, personnel uh, saw uh, an object coming in from the northeast. It stopped. This was a luminous object. All they saw was an intense light. Stopped and then moved eastbound. 
Uh, from that time on, both radar and visual observers were available. I should mention one other thing uh, that occurred at Bentwaters on this last, uh, this last of the four Bentwaters sighting. There was a, a C-47 pilot at 4,000 feet over the field who saw, concurrent with the radar, saw a bright object move below his aircraft from west to east, concurrently a tower operator at GCA, uh, at uh, um, Bentwater, saw a luminous object move uh, over his altitude. He estimated a few thousand feet. These were, con these were concurrent with the radar observations, and this, this was the composite sighting at 2255 on August uh, 13th of 56 that led to the alert of another station. They finally got that much action going. And I just mentioned that the, the uh, Lake and Heath personnel saw a luminous object come in, hover motionless, and then move off to the east. Then two radars, independent radars, uh, different frequencies. Uh, one, uh, uh, one was a, um, an air, uh, air route traffic control surveillance radar. The other was a GCA uh, radar at Lake and Heath. From this time on, are following all of the rest of the most it's, it's very involved. I'd, I'd better not attempt to describe all of it, but let me just say that for uh, quite some time, they tracked objects, sometimes one, sometimes several, which would move, hover motionless, uh, then start out with, uh, and, and the, uh, the report emphasizes with no apparent acceleration, just shift the speeds of the order of 600 to 800 miles an hour, move 10 to 20 miles, stop again, and this erratic uh, start-stop uh, acceleration-deceleration motion was being tracked uh, concurrently by, by two radars at Lake and Heath and uh, uh, observed on the ground. Finally, they decided that uh, uh, an interceptor should be scrambled, and a Venom uh, was uh, scrambled uh, from the Blue Book reports. One finds it was from Water Beach Aerodrome near Cambridge. Uh, the Venom was vectored into position on one of the targets being carried by GCA. He saw a luminous source and got a radar return as he moved in uh, under the vector direction. And this again is significant here. We have uh, three, essentially four channels, if you like, four known channels, two radars on the ground with different radar characteristics, an airborne uh, uh, radar in the Venom interceptor, and the pilot uh, seeing a luminous object. The report is unclear whether there were also ground observers seeing this luminous source. But this kind of phenomenon, which does occur, I wish to emphasize, which you do find over and over again in the Wright-Patterson Blue Book files, is uh, the sort of thing that uh, makes me think we've got a scientific problem here. Suddenly, the Venom pi uh, the pilot reported that he lost the airborne radar return and the light had blinked out, somewhat reminiscent of the B-47 incident that I just occurred and reminiscent of other cases. He was then vectored to another one of the unknown targets they had been, been carried. He moved in. This time it didn't disappear from his scope, but a different thing happened. And the the uh, uh, it was very puzzling. Dr. Heineck alluded to it very briefly. The unknown target suddenly, and uh, one of the supporting accounts uh, emphasizes uh, that this, uh, the swiftness of this maneuver, suddenly went from the pursued to the pursuer, went from ahead of the Venom to the tail position, and at that juncture the Venom interceptor pilot reported uh, that uh, he was unable to shake it, uh, the uh, five or ten minutes of uh, violent maneuvers, and the unknown target Tracked on ground radar, following this interceptor, the Venom, uh, until the Venom ran out of fuel, they had to go back. The, uh, the target, the unknown target, followed the Venom for some miles and then just stopped motionless, and the Venom went on back to base. They got another uh, Venom up in the air, but it never closed uh, with uh, the object. Uh, the radar reports continued until 03.30 in the morning. Uh, the account is uh, not uh, very detailed uh, in, the, in the remaining part, but they finally lost all uh, unknown targets at Lake and Heath about uh, three and a half hours after they had been alerted. Okay, there is another single case, which has taken me another ten minutes, I dare say, to discuss, and the point is that this is also left unexplained in the Conan Report. Dr. Heineck quoted the remark uh, about it, that uh, perhaps uh, this was, the, that perhaps this involved at least one genuine UFO, unquote. Uh, the uh, point I make is that here is the kind of thing that has been occurring and has gone into Air Force files uh, without adequate follow-up, uh, without uh, anything resembling any scientific clarification. Nobody at, at uh, uh, Air Force Cambridge asked to uh, uh, examine this, as far as one can tell from the files. There's a very brief discussion, very unsatisfactory discussion, about whether this could have been meteors. This, if you recognize the date, it is the date of the Perseids. But the count uh, uh, contains specific comments from the observers that they saw lots of shooting stars and that these 
uh, uh, targets were not in any way comparable uh, to Perseids, and this is pretty obvious uh, uh, in the first instance. It is unexplained in the Air Force uh, files. It is unexplained in the Con report. I say it is a part of the phenomenon we're talking about here that demands scientific explanation but has not got it. A third sighting, which I'll, I'll have to be very brief about, uh, uh, is uh, an older one from that period uh, of greatest uh, report activity in UFOs, 1952. Uh, the Haneda Air Force Base uh, radar visual case of August 5th of 52 is one of dozens of cases. I actually cited 110 cases when the Conner uh, Project asked me for the kinds of cases that puzzled me. This was one that I suggested, one that uh, uh, National Investigation Committee on Aerial Phenomena, NICAP, suggested, and they did examine it uh, in the Conner Report. And it is finally explained as diffraction from capella and anomalous propagation. Uh, I say, look carefully, uh, not at what is said in, in uh, the Conner Report, because it's about five paragraphs, but look at the Blue Book files. It's about 25 pages in the Blue Book case file. And you may join me in uh, saying it is a very unusual uh, case of diffraction and anomalous propagation. Uh, uh, ground observers at Haneda Air Force Base, which is near Tokyo, reported an intensely blue light. Uh, they alerted Shiroi GCI radar about 20 miles away. Uh, about 15 minutes later, another air base, American Air Unit, this is in the Korean period, uh, Tachikawa uh, contacted uh, Haneda and reported that they also were seeing a, a luminous target. Uh, they didn't say also, we said that they, they, this was an independent sighting. We asked Haneda if they saw anything. The lines of sight from Haneda and Tachikawa intersect over North Tokyo Bay, the area where, as I'll now point out, uh, ground radar uh, shortly began tracking an object and where airborne radar shortly found an object. Pressing it uh, very strongly, let me turn next to the radar. Uh, Shiroi GCI, uh, which was the nearest uh, ground radar that, that could be brought into the picture, uh, found um, stationary targets initially, and the, the ground observers reported uh, primarily stationary objects in this period. Uh, they uh, decided to scramble uh, an F-94 from Johnson Air Force Base. Uh, the the um, F-94B got in there. This is a, a, a F-94 with uh, airborne radar, uh, two uh, pilot and radar men. Uh, the, um, uh, just before the uh, F-94 got into position over North Tor Tokyo Bay, the GCI was tracking uh, a target in starboard orbit of about three mile radius. The uh, case file shows the maps uh, uh, of, the, uh, of the orbiting pattern. Uh, starboard orbit, uh, diameter about eight miles. Speeds varying from about uh, 100 uh, knots to about 300 knots, occasionally stopping. The target would stop, start again, vary its speed in starboard orbit. Second orbit around, they vectored the F-94, giving it uh, position uh, bearings on the unknown. Uh, it was vectored at 11 o'clock position, 6,000 yards, and it actually closed in the target at 10 degrees port and uh, approximately um, uh, 6 miles. Very close correspondence, so close uh, that there is no question at all, and when you read the case file, uh, that the F-94 was vectored onto the target that was being tracked in GCI. I mention this because the Conner report uh, suggests that maybe uh, there was never any correspondence between ground radar and what the airborne radar uh, study of the case file rules this out, I think, incontrovertibly. The F-94 got uh, radar return, but never got a, uh, a lock on, never got it uh, uh, directly locked on. Almost as soon as the F-94 got it on its uh, uh, APG-33 airborne radar, uh, the target accelerated uh, to the northeast across the scope, there's a B-scope, on the radar, moved rapidly across scope, the F-94 uh, went into a hard right turn and held radar return on this unknown for a minute and a half uh, as it moved northeastward towards Shiroi and both the F-94 and the target on Shiroi radar until both moved into the ground putter pattern, evidently no MTI in use on this uh, CPS-1 uh, radar uh, at Shiroi, until they moved into the ground putter and were lost after 90 seconds. So here we have uh, a, a, an old case that's been in the files for many years, was always regarded as unexplained in the Air Force files, but the Conner Report explains this as anomalous propagation. Uh, nothing, in this, nothing in this radar history suggests anomalous propagation. A, a, a discrete target moving in starboard orbit at speeds of 150 to 300 miles an hour, uh, an airborne radar, vectored airborne uh, radar, uh, 
uh, return on it, uh, pilots following it, no visual sighting at any time from the ground radar or the F-94, but that part of it explained as anomalous propagation, and the visual sighting at uh, Haneda is explained as diffraction of Capella. Uh, there is uh, uh, about six or eight independent uh, errors of meteorological optics in the diffraction explanation. I discuss these in a lot of detail in my account, but I don't believe it's even worth taking time to spell them out because I want to close with a brief uh, comment about the last of the four illustrative sightings. It happens to be a case that Dr. Heineck just alluded to very briefly, but my uh, discussion in the notes uh, would take me much longer to cover. Uh, I emphasize the sighting at Kirtland Air Force Base, 1957, November 4th, November 4th, 1957, for uh, some very different reasons. I had never heard of this case before. The Conan Report was published. The um, uh, I was very suspicious of the explanation because the case occurred at night in rain, and the common explanation is that it's a light aircraft which lost its way and did a turn below an altitude of 300 feet, then climbed out and uh, went uh, went off in the distance. Furthermore, the Conner Report claims that it did this turn while hidden from sight behind some buildings. And this occurred at Albuquerque Kirtland Air Force Base, and I thought it was very strange that CAA observers uh, would uh, be in a tower and uh, that there would be a block of airspace so large that any aircraft could do a 180-degree turn while hidden behind buildings and that any pilot still living uh, would do this at night in rain and then climb to 300 feet. So I began to check the case, and I eventually uh, got in touch with both of these witnesses. The first thing that stunned me when I talked to uh, Richard Kaser and Eugene Brink, both of whom are still with the, now FAA, is that nobody in the Condon report, in the Condon investigation, ever interrogated either witness. Here is the kind of sighting where you have the sort of witnesses that you most want to get, trained observers under very favorable conditions. They were on duty in a CAA tower with binoculars looking at this thing, and the Conan uh, group didn't even investigate them. That's true of a number of other Conan report cases, including some that are unexplained and some that are explained. Well, the Conan report goes along with the Air Force explanation that this was a, an aircraft that lost its way, but when I talked to the CAA observers, I learned that this luminous thing came down over the runway uh, at runway 26 at Kirtland, then diagonal across the runways, leaving the, the safe uh, runway area and moving across taxiways and over grass and everything else at about 10, 20 foot estimated altitude until it hovered over a B-58 uh, pad near the drumhead uh, secure area in full view, and I emphasize this, of the tower observers, both Brink and Kaser stressed that they got seven power binoculars on this immediately. It was at a point about 3,000 feet from the tower with seven power binoculars. This is 200 foot equivalent distance. And their description of it was it was an egg shaped object with a light on the bottom, completely unlike any aircraft that they had ever seen. Very emphatic about this. I got the Blue Book file report. It is equally clear on this point. The object hovered for a time of approximately a minute, then went eastward and climbed at a speed that both men emphasized to me and to the major from an Air Force base who did the initial investigation, that it climbed at a rate that uh, was uh, unprecedented in their experience. In 1969, they said it was still, uh, they'd never seen anything that uh, compared with this. It disappeared into the overcast, was then tracked by the RAPCON radar, uh, went south about uh, 10 miles, hovered uh, uh, in tight orbit, and then came back and went into tail position behind a C-46 that was leaving Kirtland Air Force Base and disappeared uh, from the scene. Well, that case, which I have uh, just very briefly described, is considered explaining the Conner Report. It is so considered without benefit of any contact with either of the two witnesses. The circumstances of the case are so utterly unlike anything described in the Condon evaluation that I uh, cite this as an illustration of the very low level of argumentation that I would be able to um, uh, cite many other examples. In very brief summary, then, I say that we have a problem here that has been ignored. Science is in default for leading in, in this state for 20 years. Uh, Air Force Blue Book investigations and all of the consultant panels and groups they've brought to bear on it have not closed with the problem in an adequate way. The phenomena do defy ready explanation. The extraterrestrial hypothesis is the hypothesis which I regard as least unlikely and uh, uh, m perhaps most probable. Uh, obviously fraught with all kinds of immediate questions, but when you have looked, as I have, at hundreds of cases and interviewed, as I have, oh, about four or five hundred witnesses, you are stuck with a problem that fits no conventional terrestrial explanation. And this fascinating possibility 
that there might in fact be some something roughly describable as extraterrestrial surveillance involved in the UFO problem is the possibility, the hypothesis, that I regard most probable. Thank you.